Cool. Okay. Uh, so, hi. I'm uh, I'm Matt. I'm uh, a site reliability engineer at Yelp. Um, don't ask me what a site reliability engineer is. Ask Google. Still have no idea. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, security patching system packages is fun, said no one ever. Um, so, as always, start with a conclusion. Uh, so basically, like, I'm going to be talking about system packaging um, and the security patching system packages, uh, but largely I'm mostly going to be using it as an example of, uh, of sort of kind of these points. So like, uh, I'm actually, actually going to read through these. Um, so the takeaway I want you to get from this is that uh, some security tasks are just a drag. Sometimes you just have to suck it up. That's why you get paid. Um, and, but, you know, in order to sort of combat that, you know, you can use social engineering for the protagonists too. Um, so you can, use, uh, you can use things to sort of motivate your engineers in order to get some of this, like, real drag work done. Um, and you can use tooling to minimize the pain and to maximize motivation. Um, you can use technology to help solve people problems, which is directly counter to what my first boss ever told me. Um, and also, lol, package management. Um, so who, why, why should you be listening to me? Um, because, because I'm an operations guy who worries too much. Like, I, I think I'm probably the least qualified person here to talk about security. But I do worry about it a lot. Uh, I do think about it a lot. I also like to uh, think that I'm socially intelligent in some way, shape, or form. But uh, basically, all of the pop psychology that I'm probably about to spout, I've never read anywhere other than the internet before. So like, you know, take everything I say with a pinch of salt. Um, OK, so uh, who are Yelp? Uh, so we're, we're basically uh, a website, an app, and all the rest. Um, we, uh, we basically crowdsource reviews uh, from an extensive community, and the idea is to help people discover uh, businesses around them. Um, we're also a pretty big engineering organization. Uh, so to give you an idea of the scale, and this is all Q2 2016, um, but then again, most of the stuff we did in this talk is Q2 2016, so it's mostly relevant. Uh, well, we had uh, approximately 92 million unique uh, monthly visitors on mobile, including uh, app and mobile web. Uh, more than 108 million reviews contributed since inception. 72% um, of all searches uh, came from mobile. Uh, Yelp is also present across 32 different countries. Um, Additional to this, because uh, this, these, these, are, these are like the PR slides, um, we're, uh, we're also, um, in terms of like our, our, actual phys uh, our actual sort of presence on the web, uh, we're hybrid TIN, AWS cloud as well, uh, moving more and more towards AWS. Um, and uh, we have, I think, four different engineering offices. So our main office is San Francisco. Uh, I'm from the team in London, obviously. Um, and then uh, we also have engineering office in Hamburg and uh, a much smaller one in Dublin. So the operations team. Um, so we're not your sort of traditional, you know, just rebooting and saying no kind of operations team. Like I like to think we're kind of like post DevOps, like all of our VOPs have been DevOpt. Um, and uh, basically, you know, we, we've, we've been building our own PaaS called PASTA, which stands for Platform as a Service Totally Awesome, because we're good at backronyming. Um, uh, yeah, so, so we're doing that, we're managing our edge, um, supporting deploys, developer workflows. Um, so basically, like, the most boring thing out of all of that stuff, we've got all of these amazing, interesting things that we could have our amazing, interesting engineers working on, but uh, server in instance maintenance is not one of those interesting things. And under that comes, you know, security patching. So actually, you know, we're a team that, that is a driving force to de delivering innovation and new business value. We don't want to be just, like, worrying about which package version is what. Um, so this, um, <laughs> how many of you kind of identify with this? Everything's on fire. This is fine. All right, I think you're all liars, to be honest. Um, so basically, th this, is, this is kind of like a very traditional ops kind of way of feeling about like security vulnerabilities coming out. So um, like in the bad old days, well, what we tend to do is like, you know, we have our, our email feed of Ubuntu security notices telling us you've got to patch this, you've got to patch that. And you sort of go like, okay, this is, this is, this is fine. Uh, somebody's probably dealing with this. 
because it's going in our collective inbox. Um, and, uh, you know, once in a while, they'll come along something that's like, you know, bind nine vulnerability is like, shit, maybe we should actually definitely do that one. Um, but things kind of, things evolve, things changed. And, and um, as Elizabeth was saying, like, you know, the, the security landscape is changing massively. There's, there's so much more of this, like, you know, information as currency, so much more data in the cloud. Um, and ultimately, something's going to come along at some point that's going to make everybody wake up. And, uh, and I like to kind of think that this is one of the big turning points, hence why I wore my I Heart Bleed SSL t-shirt today. Um, this is like the first big branded vulnerability, um, and it really did shock quite a lot of people, and it really should do, because uh, if you don't know how Heartbleed works, basically open SSL clients could read arbitrary lengths of memory out of the server, like, great, good job, guys. Um, and I think this moves us more along to this kind of mentality. Um, this, is, this is not fine, like, we can't continue on this way, because if we're letting these things slip through the gaps, then you know, ultimately, we're, we're, landing, uh, we're landing ourselves in a position whereby uh, we know that other people, other nefarious people are getting the same vulnerabilities in their inbox, and they're far more interested in them than we are, um, because they can make real bank on that sort of thing. You know, they can sell information, that sort of stuff. So, you know, we need to start to take action. We need to start to realize that actually it's a pretty bad situation, and we have to fight the growing tide of of vulnerabilities, um, and basically relying on reading vulnerabilities that make it to Hacker News to do your job properly is really not a great way of catching all the edge cases. So what's the problem here? Um, well, patching system packages is hard and boring. Um, so, you know, there are obviously like the things that are difficult to upgrade in place, like your MySQL master. You're not just going to do app get upgrade and hope you don't drop any writes. Um, and uh, additionally, you know, coming from like the sort of context of actually Yelp, uh, you know, our actual problems. Um, as a company who've, who've done quite a lot of moving fast and innovation, you don't innovate without leaving behind some technical debt. So, I mean, amongst here, we've got um, Yelp packs, who are, were like sort of our configuration management before configuration management. Uh, they're basically like Debian packages that contain a repo source, and they're actually a meta package for a bunch of other packages. Um, it's basically doing like clever stuff with apt. Um, We've also got, uh, for, for, for some edge cases, what we like to uh, lovingly refer to as Franken-Lucid. It's uh, Ubuntu 10.04, which is out of support, which we keep alive with, uh, with backported kernel packages and all sorts. Basically, edge cases. I mean, Docker is one here as well. You can't just do SSH in a for loop to figure out what's installed in your Docker containers, because they shouldn't be running SSH. Um, <clears throat> the thing to take away from this, to be fair, is... Uh, Doing clever things with that. Whatever you do, don't. Um, I, if, if I can do nothing else but live to serve as a warning for others, don't. Um, so I know what you're all thinking, patching system packages isn't that hard. You just do apt get upgrade. Um, so even if your stack is simple enough for you to just be able to do an apt get upgrade uh, on your running whatever with zero downtime, um, I'm here to tell you that actually uh, I was testing out uh, an upgrade of libpam um, for like DLD Frank and Lucid in a Docker container. So I downloaded the three packages that needed to be upgraded. I manually installed them with dpackage, and dpackage does what it has always done since the dawn of time, but you never remember because you always use apt, um, which is go, oh, there's these things that like, I think need restarting. There's these three different things that I know rely on PAM. Uh, do you want to add any more to that list? And I'm like, uh, yeah, maybe SSH, like possibly. Um, and this got me to thinking like, well, actually, how often um, are we actually upgrading a thing? An app is using the defaults and not actually restarting services that rely on this thing. So I started wondering like, well, if I can't rely on what app's telling me and what's on disk, I need to be able to look into memory to work out like what the hell's going on here. And one of my colleagues pointed me to uh, uh, in the slash proc file system, proc, PID of whatever program you're trying to look at, maps. So what this script does is uh, you, you give it a string to search for, and it will basically crawl through every uh, proc, every PID uh, in the proc file system. 
and it will look for anything, uh, as you can see that there, that grep, this is awful bash, by the way, I'm really sorry. Uh, the grep there for deleted. Um, run this on your longest running server that you've been doing apt get upgrades on and see how many deleted libraries are still actually being run. So you're still vulnerable because that vulnerable code is still in memory. It's, it's kind of scary. Um, <laughs> So basically what I'm getting at here is this needs eyes on from engineering. Um, you know, for tech debt, reproducible builds, all of that, at least until we build confidence in like uh, actually removing some of our old crap um, and being in a position whereby, you know, we think that we can automate like um, stuff like, you know, pinning our repositories so that we can get those reproducible builds and just be able to do those apt get upgrades in order to do security patching. But it's really dull. So what did we do? Um, well, first, first things first, like in order to actually sort of take some accountability, like, I, I mean, I don't believe that anything that's everybody's responsibility will get done unless you actually dump it in someone's backyard. Hence the phrase, not in my backyard. Um, so uh, we, we created the uh, AutoSec uh, JIRA project. So basically these, these emails that we're getting like fire hosed in, um, they basically now automatically create tickets uh, in, in this JIRA project. Um, and uh, we had a script, which we lovingly refer to as the Wheel of Misfortune, um, which got run manually once in a while um, in order to actually you know, dish these tickets out to individuals. So how did this work for us? Well, what you can see here, the, um, the orange is to do. <laughs> the purple is done. Um, now, let's not, be, uh, let's not be too hard on ourselves, because now at least we actually know that this isn't being done. Um, and, you know, hey, look, there's some purple. That's cool, right? Um, but ultimately, these things are still piling up. You can see sort of once in a while where, like, somebody will decide, oh, I'm going to purge all of these tickets we've got for, like, OMAP4 kernel vulnerabilities, because I really hope that our servers aren't running OMAP4 kernels. Um, but, you know, like you can see that once in a while someone spins the wheel of misfortune. It's not a very, like, maintainable system. And also, like, why are people not doing tickets that are assigned to them? Like, I mean, honestly, people get assigned tickets. They do the tickets. That's how it works, right? Well, not necessarily. Like, because tedious stuff is really tedious. Um, and ultimately, when you've got amazing work you could be doing on your, on your platform as a service or, or, you know, juggling your edge traffic and stuff like that, you know, doing new innovative things, sometimes when you've got those tedious tickets that are hard to do, you're going to put them at the bottom of your priority list, especially if they don't have any deadlines on them. So um, what do engineers like? Well, they like interesting work. They like new things. They like feedback. A tight feedback loop is really important. Um, to know that you're making any, uh, any impact at all. Uh, and they also like agency. Um, and like agency is like one of my big words at the moment. Um, I'll bang on about it till the cows come home. Um, agency is like the propensity of an engineer to cause something to combust, right? Um, but like in all seriousness, like it's the capacity of an actor to act in a given environment. Um, Wikipedia. Uh, and that's a really, really important thing, because basically, we as engineers, we want to be able to fix problems. Like, I'm going to go against the normal op stereotype here and be optimistic in that, like, you know, people say Hanlon's razor, uh, never attribute to malice that which can be explained by stupidity. I say never attribute to malice that which can be explained by lack of agency. Like, we want to solve these problems. It's just that they're, they're hard. It's hard to act in some of these, in these situations. So what has AutoSec got going for it? It's not interesting. None of it's different from previous iterations. The feedback loop is pretty much non-existent. And this is a really important thing about defensive security, right? Um, if you patch a package, there's no longer a vulnerability. If you don't patch a package, it's still pretty unlikely that anybody's going to take advantage of that, unless it's something like Heartbleed. There's no feedback loop at all. You don't feel like you've solved the problem because you weren't getting hacked in the first place, hopefully. And again, it's still, I'm not getting hacked. That I know of. Fantastic. Um, and there's no real agency to it. And this is, this is particularly a problem of our, uh, of our process and our workflow in all of this, in that um, uh, basically the critical path for this is hard to find. There was no real like 
policy on how do you make decisions about what to patch, what not to patch, how to patch things. Um, the docs were just disjointed for all the different sort of edge cases I was talking about. Um, and decisions are difficult because there's no feedback loop. Like, once you've completed one, one set of tickets, like, how has that informed the rest of them? It hasn't. Um, and so what do you do? You defer and procrastinate, you know? Um, <laughs> and who wants to hire a deferring procrastinator? Uh, so what do I think we can fix? Like, how can we get from that stage of, like, this is fine, to actually, this is really not fine. Like, l let's actually do something about this. Let's be proactive about it. Well, I'm not a wizard, so I can't make it interesting all of a sudden. And I certainly can't make it new. Like, this is janitorial work. Um, but what I reckon we can do is I reckon we can add in some feedback, and I reckon we can sort of increase, like, perceived agency of the whole thing. Because it's not like these tasks aren't things that our engineers can't do. They just don't necessarily feel super enabled to. Like, they don't feel like their ability to act is maximized. So we decided, so we work in, like, OKRs. I think they're objective key results, but they're, like, sort of organizational goals. Um, and one of them that we started doing was the Autosec OKR. Um, the idea for this being like to uh, be aim to reduce the mean time to resolution for security tickets uh, within uh, second quarter. The idea being that anything new that comes in now should be resolved within two weeks, unless it's absolutely critical. Uh, close out all pre Q2 2016 tickets. So that backlog, that big swathe of uh, orange, what's say orange? Um, that needs to disappear, and that was one of our goals. Um, now, one of the things about this is that we had organiz organizational buy-in, so we are playing on easy mode, right? And I appreciate that this is a really difficult thing to do for some people. Um, so one of the things to bear in mind in the following slides is like the methods that we use, um, they are, uh, the methods that we use, they're, they're not necessarily like, things that you have to have that organizational buy-in for, you can sort of like do it bit by bit. You can, you can just decide you're going to do some stuff, you know? Um, so how do we go about doing it? So uh, automating distri distribution of work, uh, including adding deadlines, increases agency, because you know how to prioritize then. Uh, tying up feedback loop with me metrics and frequent reports. Whilst you won't necessarily know the weather, you can know the climate. So what's the position and the momentum in terms of how close are we to actually being on top of this problem, um, and make cr the critical path of decisive action more explicit. So improve documentation, make it easy to get help, uh, and improve perceived, ag perceived agency again. Um, so one of the key parts of this is you've got to recognize the futility of it. Like These are going to keep coming in. They're going to continue to be boring. Um, there are some key problems here, like asking non-security specialists to make security decisions is really hard. People don't feel confident in themselves, especially if they, like me, don't have security in their job title. Um, won't fix is against engineering nature. Like, we, we want to fix everything. Um, but to a degree, that's naive interventionism, like, in the sense that if you want to solve the security problem completely, unplug all your Ethernet cables, right? Problem solved. Um, but actually, you know, you need to balance this against actually moving faster than your competitors, delivering business value. Um, the other thing is, like, you only find out when you do the wrong thing in terms of tight feedback. Um, like, you get hacked, so that's how you know you did the wrong thing. Uh, so you need to empower people to make hard decisions that have little payoff. So uh, one of the first things we did is, uh, was create the Autosec Review Mail Group. And this is just a bunch of people who'd expressed interest who you can tag in on your ticket. So, like, if you say, I'm not going to fix this thing, I'm not going to do anything, there's no code review involved in that. So what you do is you make so that when people want to make that decision, they can say, I'm going to do this for, the, for these reasons. Tag these people. Anybody can then dive in and say, OK, yeah, that sounds cool. Ship it. Um, and, and this is kind of the theme is like anything you can do to make things less painful. Um, so work distribution. Uh, so we created a service. Um, which could basically have been a cron job, uh, which is just interfacing with Jira. Like, Jira is a tool we've already got. Um, so we can basically say, like, we can roll the, mirror, or the wheel of misfortune automated on a regular basis. Um, and that, that really helps, you know, because then there's a, there's a sort of uh, 
flat level of your sort of incoming number of tickets, easier to manage workflow. Um, we've got feedback, so like metrics and reporting. Um, Netflix, Skunk Works, Gojira is great if you want to do reporting based off of Jira stuff. Um, so we were sending out emails saying this is, this is how close we are to the goal, keep up the good work. Um, and it helps people know that they're, that they're helping us progress. You know, they're working towards a central thing. And, and ultimately, you've got to bear in mind that this is pretty much the only feedback we've got. Um, increase agency, critical path. Uh, there is a horrible wall of text. So you reduce the horrible wall of text. So like, uh, we cleared up the documentation. Um, a well-defined process on paper is still difficult to follow. I'll get into that again in like a second. Um, but we did it anyway because it's on the critical path to actually knowing what our process is. Uh, so we increase agency by removing uh, extraneous information. So like, in terms of the way the documents were previously laid out for this, you get to the end of the document after having read the whole thing and said, oh yeah, you don't need to do anything. I'm like, could have told me earlier. Um, so reorganizing that stuff so that like, a no-op is basically the first thing you find out about. Like, don't give people more information than they need because that decreases agency. Because a document is basically something that you read uh, in order to be able to do a job when you don't know how to do it. Um, if you do know how to do it, there are problems associated with that too. Um, but moving on, uh, so... Uh, we also introduced the Nagbot. This is part of our Autosec service, and it would basically tell people how long they had to finish the ticket, whether it was going to overrun. And this is because deadlines are really important, right? If you want to prioritize work, um, you're not going to do shitty work that somebody said it just needs to be done, or it should have been done, or stuff like that, because clearly there's no like, impetus for it. If you've got a deadline, you can balance against the more interesting work. So did it work? Um, well. This, over here, is where I cut off the graph earlier. I'd say that's pretty good, personally. Like, that is an improved situation going on right there. Um, this is a very, very blurry slide, stolen from somebody else's slide on a webinar, because I didn't actually want to have to look this information up, but uh, they did it for me. Hooray! Um, I would bet money on the fact that that remaining not done stuff uh, that's probably all to do with our Yelp packs, which we're working on in the background. But those tickets are really, really difficult to do. Um, so what are we going to do next to improve? Uh, so we're going to reduce like sort of pointless overhead. So stuff like um, Snapdragon kernels, we're not really running those. So we need to cut out these incoming tickets and auto triage information out of them. And maybe we can introspect and feed back into the ticket automatically. Where is this installed? Uh, how old is the version, that sort of thing. We also need to eliminate like mental caching. Um, so I was thinking about like who just reads off of a script? People who ring you up and told, tell you you've been missold PPI. And I like to imagine that maybe they're like, a, it's actually a person driving a robot with a keyboard that says like missold PPI. Like I heard you were in a car accident that wasn't your fault. Um, so it's the idea of producing an interface is actually suited to this whole thing. If we can turn the documentation into a script that asks you questions um, and does actions based on your answers, then actually we've uh, removed extraneous information. We've made the process more interactive. Uh, but also process changes can be code reviewed um, for greater confidence. And it means that people don't mentally cache the documents. They, they will know when a difference occurs simply because they'll be running the script because it's easier than reading the document. Because nobody likes reading documents even once. And also fix our packaging. But like, yeah, whatever. Who cares? Um, so the takeaway. Uh, some security tasks are just a drag. Social engineering is for protagonists too. Um, use tooling to minimize pain and maximize motivation. Uh, and you can use technology to help solve people problems and lol package management. And I think I'm like well over time. Uh, thanks for listening.